Welcome to Inside the Director's Brain. So it's almost like a science experiment this evening. <laughs> um, a conversation with Tara Branham and myself moderated by one of our beloved board members, Lawrence Kern, who's here this evening. Welcome all of you. I just want to say this is one of the things that we love to do for our subscribers is to bring you close as close as possible to the art making, peek behind the curtain, up close and personal. We are so grateful for your support and for being a part of the Opera San Jose family. We're thrilled to have you join us tonight in a um, heartening and maybe even um, debate, debating conversation about the craft of stage direction. We're very excited to get into it tonight. Um, I'd love to take a brief moment to introduce our moderator this evening, Larry Kern. In the fall of 1965, Larry Kern enrolled in Indiana University School of Music, but soon figured out he was not musically talented and transferred to the business school. <laughs> fortunately, music and especially opera became his lifelong hobby. And I can say, oh, we are so fortunate. To, that it has been part of his lifelong hobby. Larry was president and chief executive officer of Ready Pack Produce Inc. from 2004 to 2006. From 2001 to 2004, he was president and chief operating officer of Dole Food Company Inc. And he served as president of its Dole Fresh Vegetable subsidiary from 1993 until 2001. Prior to that, he was vice president and general manager of Bird's Eye, a subsidiary of Kraft General Foods. He currently serves on the boards of Opera San Jose, the Los Angeles Opera, and the San Francisco Opera. He is an alumnus of Indiana University, where he received his BS in finance in 1969 and his MBA in 1972. Welcome to the Zoom, Larry. We're thrilled to have you uh, as our moderator tonight talking about stage direction. Thank you very much. After hearing that background, I'm glad I'm not working anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to introduce uh, uh, Shauna and Tara. Uh, Shauna is originally from Houston. She graduated from the University of Texas at Austin with a BA in theater and a second BA in Italian. After working as a director in New York City, she returned to Moscow, where she had completed a semester at the world famous Moscow Out Art Theater. Uh, to, uh, she returned there to pursue her MFA in directing and stage movement from the Boris Shukin Theater Institute and at the Vakhtanov Theater. In 2022, she became the general director and CEO of Opera San Jose. Shauna is known for her feminist stagings of classic and modern pieces, bring, bringing passionate new resonance to the war horses of opera and grappling with contemporary works through a feminist paradigm. Her work has been seen at the Santa Fe Opera, San Francisco Opera, Bread and Puppet Theater, Lyric Opera of Kansas City, the Dallas Opera, Skylight Music Theater, the Bolshoi Theater, and the Schauspiel in Hanover. Most recently, she created the new legacy production of La Traviata for the San Francisco Opera's centennial season. In, in 2023, she will uh, receive her master's of science in nonprofit management from Columbia University. Her other passion is nail art, which you can see on her Instagram uh, posts. And she's, uh, the, the nails are amazing. So now let's let's talk a little bit about uh, Tara. Uh, Tara, who was born and raised in Floyd's Knobs, Indiana, is a director and producer based in Chicago. Currently, Tara is the resident director with the Opera San Jose. Most recently, she directed the remount of Shauna Lucy's production of, of A Mall on the Night Visitors with the Lyric uh, Opera of Kansas City. This past summer, she directed the U.S. premiere of Coraline with West Edge Opera and Fenland Lamb's Paper Moon Opera Productions. Her direction of Three Decembers, produced by Opera San Jose, starring Susan Graham, Efren Solis, and Maya Karani, have been streamed around the world. 
Tara's direction of the US premiere of Octagon, uh, starring Kiki Lane uh, at the Jackalope Theater received a sold out extension. This was a culmination of three years of development work and collaboration with playwright Christiana Ray Cologne. Summer of 2023, uh, Tara is slated to direct a new production of Cozy Fantute with the Opera Theater of uh, St. Louis. Tara is a teacher and creator of the Unbridled Sound, a physical vocal technique for performers. She graduated cum laude from Ball State University. So I think we're ready to go, right? Let's dive in. Sounds okay. Fun. So when you're asked to direct a piece like an opera, what's your first step? Let's start with Shauna and then go to Tara. Thanks for that, uh, for that introduction of both of us, Larry, and for this first question. So the first step for me when uh, I'm approached to work on an opera even if it's an opera that I know and I've worked on before, is to put on my headphones, go for a long walk and listen to the opera. Just listen to the music. That's the first step for me to see, to make sure that the music resonates with who I am, that I am connecting with the music first and foremost. Um, and then I began a much longer series of actions that have to do with getting a hold of the physical score, getting a hold of the translation to make sure I understand all of the words, and then an extensive research period. Um, a lot of research goes into the approach uh, before you, you make any kind of decisions about an opera. But yeah, the first step for me, got to put on those headphones and listen to it again or for the first time. How about you, Tara? Oh, you're muted, Tara. Uh-oh. We'll Thank unmute you, you, I bet. Um, for me, often the first step is being introduced to the opera. Um, normally, I am approaching opera from a, a very new lens. Uh, as of right now. And so the first thing that I do is I see what is available to stream online to watch the opera. Um, so I want to listen to it, absorb it from a storytelling perspective uh, with the visuals. It helps me to see it um, in addition to hearing it. And then after that, I usually go to Wikipedia and see the character breakdown like everyone else. I go and check out Wikipedia and see where that is. And then the ne very next step for me is often asking everyone I know who loves opera what they love about that opera. I wanna get a sense of what people who have been listening to this opera for uh, 60, 70 years, if the opera is um, one of the war horses, especially, um, what they love about it, what they have always loved about it and what they can remember from the first time they saw it to the most recent time they saw it. Thank you. So how do you go about researching an opera? Let's start with Tara. You know, I like to find a book or two that can guide me through a process. So uh, Tosca was suggested by Shauna Lucy. Tosca's Rome was one of the books that I read. Um, and then I also did research around the original play, um, the Sardu Tos uh, La Tosca. Um, so I'll find these pieces and then I will start to, through that deep dive into those pieces, pull in ancillary materials. So that can be articles about um, war, articles about Napoleon, articles about, and so there's all of these little tiny pieces that start to like form this tree of knowledge um, that allow me to have strong opinions about, um, hopefully about everything. Um, and then I also will absorb as much of the opera as possible. So that is listening to every recorded version that I can find, seeing the opera, uh, and then also watching the opera in digital form uh, if, if seeing it in real life is not a possible option for me. I really like to know 
where we as a culture are in absorbing the opera. So what do we know already? and what is gonna potentially be new for us. And because I am new at the moment, I can go through the libretto and say, ooh, what is this storytelling moment? How am I going to track this? Uh, ooh, I didn't know that that was gonna happen. And then I can compare and contrast the libretto from what I've seen in the different productions. So what has tradition started to require from the production versus what was originally written in the libretto? That's fascinating. Thank you. How about you, uh, Shauna? Yeah, that's great. I, I identify with a lot of what Tara is saying. Um, when, uh, when I started preparing Traviata at San Francisco, I was very fortunate because my sister is a, um, an academic and she had just published her first book called Love for Sale, which is about uh, courtesans and actually all levels of prostitution in Imperial Russia in the 19th century, which of course is very, very based on Marie de Plessy and, and all of the courtesans in France. And so I was so excited. And my sister was like, no problem. Let me, I've got a whole list. She sent me a book list of like 25 books, okay. everything from like a, a policeman's report of how many prostitutes in Paris had syphilis in like the year that Traviata takes place. So in other words, you cast your net like as wide as possible because you don't know exactly what's going to tickle your your fancies up up above. You want to put all every single piece of historical context into your bucket whether or not you're going to set it in the exact time period because when you're looking so you know you cast this big research net very wide and then you go into the characters and you start thinking about them in that historical context. So you, so you have to have a sense of the socioeconomic political realities that the characters would have been living in that inform the power dynamics of the drama, of the action of the piece itself. Um, so that you can start even thinking about acting choices or about character choices, because especially with some of these war horses, pieces. So I've done Tosca about, I, I actually don't even know how many times. And most of the time it's been pretty traditional-ish, esque. But each of those productions at the beginning of my career assisting and then moving into my own direction, it has been a fascinating experience. Similarly, Traviata, because different times of your artistic career, different points of the research come into kind of in, into your foreground and really inform a different way of understanding the characters. And so you're having like a long lifelong conversation with these pieces, which speaks to why opera audiences want to see them again and again and again. Great. So, so can you shed light on how you work with the design team? Um, you want to yeah. start, you want to start that, uh, Shauna? I'll jump in because I, I that that question always makes me laugh because I think of uh, a few instances. Um, I'm very lucky to have, you know, it's a complicated and brilliant and wonderful relationship between director and designers because, you know, you want to work with people who you click with, who you, you immediately have a common language with, who get you, who understand your ethos. Um, and when I was preparing Tosca for San Francisco, that was my first voyage with Robert Innes Hopkins. And he and I, you know, it was basically what, what would be a blind date, except we're making a giant opera together. <laughs> and so here we go. We're like sitting in his studio in London and like, you know, it's very funny. He later told me his daughter, who was like 11 or 12 at the time, was headed to school, that she was impressed that he was working with somebody who had a nose ring. She thought that was cool. Um, but <laughs> so we're like starting to talk about Puccini's Tosca. We're listening to the opera. We're talking about the text. And so he was doing sets and costumes. And I said, you know, Robert, I have to warn you that costumes, like I have like a lot of, I mean, a massive amount of feelings about costumes. I have, there is no end 
to my opinion and passion for what the, the clothes that I'm seeing on stage. And I told him in no uncertain terms, there would be no empire waste waistlines on, on the, on the stage. I was, I mean, I was pacing up and down in his studio. And at some point he looked at me and said, Shauna message received like enough, enough with talking about the empire dress lines, but to, just to touch a little bit on the research part, when, when I was preparing Tosca, I knew I could not stand to have any empire dress lines. I hate that dress line. It makes women, I think look terrible, especially on stage. And it's just an opinion, obviously a, a very firmly held one. And if you like empire dress lines, I'm glad because they should be liked by someone, just not me. <laughs> and, um, so I was desperate to find proof that in 1800, I could get away with not putting empire dress lines on stage. And I was like desperate. I mean, I was all over the internet. I was, I mean, I was bereft because I couldn't find any evidence that people weren't wearing empire dress lines in Rome at that time. So I, in a, in a fit of sadness, went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, where I lived at the time. And I was like marching around that museum, like looking at paintings, like show me some other dress lines besides these damn empire dress. And there happened to be an exhibit of the great painter Vijay Lebrun, who was one of the only female painters who was admitted into the French Academy. And she had painted a number of actresses of the time period, as well as some uh, aristocrats. Uh, oh, I see. I see there's a question, empire dress line and empire dress line. If you think about Bridgerton, everybody know about Bridgerton, Jane Austen, that's that dress line. It's a very, very high, high waist right under the, right under the bosom, right under the breast line. And then a very flowy kind of skirt underneath. Um, and so luckily there was this, you know, painting exhibition of this brilliant painter with the evidence that I needed. So I bought the book. And I, and I like called Robert from the museum and I was like, look, I have the proof. We don't have to put them on stage. And so if you look at my production of Tosca, there are no empire dress lines except for one that Robert put in as a joke to me. <laughs> it's on a child in the, in the children, in the children's course. There's one girl, a small girl who he can called fashion forward. She's ahead of her time. She's wearing the empire dress line. And he did it just to troll me. So, you know, there are lots of ways to talk about how you collaborate with di designers, but what you want is that, that you come together, you get into the material, you push each other. And then what you come up with is greater than what each of you had brought to the table. That's great. So Tara, can you tell us about your working with the, the design team? So much of it is so similar to what Shauna's described. Um, I was very fortunate and in some ways unfortunate for all future collaborations that my first 12 years of directing, uh, my scenic designer is my now husband. Um, so we would start to do our research together and the same sort of absorption process he would do from a scenic focused lens and I would do from like a world and people focused lens. And then like our pillow talk was talking about everything we wanted to do um, in the, the, the show that we were working on. And then eventually we would pare it down. Um, now, obviously that has had to change. And since um, my most recent collaboration uh, is with Stephen Kemp, who is uh, a wonderful designer that we get to work with op at Opera San Jose. I'll speak to that more specifically. Um, Stephen has a wealth of knowledge. Again, um, he is very inspired by art. I am very inspired by painters, much like Shauna speaking to, looking at what these artists were impacted by in the time periods within which they were painting. So if you know where you want to, if when I know where I want to set it, I start absorbing the art from the period. So because I knew I wanted my Cosi Fantuti to exist sort of in the world of World War II. And I am deeply inspired by, um, by the surrealist uh, collage art that happened immediately following that. 
I knew that I wanted the set by the end of it to feel like a surrealist collage. So all of these things have accreted on stage that are still beautiful and aesthetic, um, but also there's a bit of a mess to it. Um, and so I said, Stephen, this is the big idea. And I know that what I need people to feel when they walk into that space is the expectation that they are going to see a beautiful, blooming, uh, flowery tea rose of a uh, cozy fan tutti. So I want the gilding. I want the pretty, pretty windows. I want to, so, so mine and what I speak to with my designer is how I want to make our audience feel. And then he or they or she um, with the, their knowledge of how the architecture of the period can impact people will say, well, this makes me feel this way. Does it make you feel that way too? And then that's how we're, our cross collaboration really starts to happen. Much like Shauna said, I have an extreme opinion about costumes, especially the way that bodies are dressed on stage. Um, and I am a down to the underwear kind of girl. So when I see that they've costumed their, the underwear appropriately, I'm like, oh, it's so exciting. Um, <laughs> nails are big for me on, um, on my cast. I'm like, nails matter. And people are like, you can't see them. I'm like, it impacts the way they move their hands. And people are like, really? I'm like, mm -hmm, absolutely it does. <laughs> so that level of detail and specificity, when you have a collaborator who's willing to meet you there is really exciting. So, um, so that you're working on the new cozy. Um, so how was it to work on the uh, Tosca, which is you know not a new production, you're reviving? I got to approach it from the perspective of, hmm, I wonder why they did this. Let me go talk to Steven and see if he can shed light on it. Um, my first question was about the paintings in Act um, in Act One, because they're not the depiction of um, the cru the crucifixion of Jesus, the depiction of the crucifixion of Saint Andrew, um, and so it's that more exile cross, um, which can have lots of different connotations and meanings, and so I wanted to know why we had gravitated toward that. And so I asked Stephen and he looked at me and like blinked twice and was like, they're the actual paintings. And I, <laughs> well, you know, it, it dawned upon me that it's, and I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, no. that the church is Santa Andrea della Valle. So that's, you know, a side chapel, that's St. Andrew. Accurate. Exactly. So I knew that I was engaging with an incredibly site-specific, hyper-realistic depiction of, of what Tosca would be. So from that point forward, I knew I needed to invest fully in the set and say, this is my set because this is the true nature of what it is. And then what are the challenges that I will face in my staging based on um, this initial collaboration that had happened prior to me and what are the secrets of the set? So sort of thinking through what might I want to do and then is it possible? So I would like to add a bed into act two. Is that possible? And talking to Steven about that and him saying, yeah, I think we can. This is where it can happen. Um, knowing that I wanted to make us feel the action even more intensely. Is it possible to move things down five feet? So going back and forth with collaboration and saying, these are the tools that we have. Is it possible to rearrange these tools at all? And if it's not possible to rearrange these tools at all, how does my perspective on it shift or how does that become a container within which I'm creating? Because I know that I thrive within boundaries. So a set then becomes the boundary of what my creativity is. And that's good because of the boundaries right here. I like to be right here. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's, the, it's that beautiful kind of creative friction that is still allowed to happen. So the bed was not in the original production? It was not. Oh, that's great. That's really interesting to know. Okay, Shauna, your turn. 
<laughs> um, I wholeheartedly agree with everything Tara has just said. I have been fortunate to, along my career, direct a number of not new productions. And I, I always enjoyed it because it's a little bit like an intellectual challenge because you didn't make the original choices. So you, you're making your own staging with a little bit of like a straight jacket on. So you got to like wiggle your way around to make it make sense for you. Um, Lee Fiskness, who uh, was our lighting designer for Tosca, um, working with Tara, I did a marriage of Figaro with him in Milwaukee many years ago. That was um, a set of tried and true, had appeared on the great stages of many, 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 many opera companies over many, 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 many years. And, you know, it, it totally told the story of, of Marriage of Figaro standard, but with the elements of lighting, we were able to really transform what the, what the set was doing. And I was able to make choices that really resonated for me, for what I, I think is important in the piece and what to highlight and how to, you know, I like a little anachronism in, in comedy. And so we were able to add some props, which is always good, you know, just keep the, when you inherit a set, it's just really about finding out what's, what's, what's the props budget, right? <laughs> how many, how many props can I add <laughs> until, until I get cut off? <laughs> Great. So tell us what happens in the rehearsal room and from the very beginning to the very end. And let's start with Tara. Um, so first of all, you should know that the rehearsal room is my favorite place on the planet. I would be in the rehearsal room every day of my life if I could. Um, I think it is my responsibility and privilege um, to get to shape rooms uh, that can hold uh, like the fa failures and futures is kind of how I like to think about it. Um, so I start off by getting everyone on the same page quite literally. And that comes a lot from my theatrical background. I normally start with some kind of read through. Now, whether that is we're reading it verbatim um, because it's written in English or we are articulating what our transliteration of that text means because for some of our choristers or for some of our compromari, it might be the first time that they've actually heard all of what verbatim is being said in the story. Um, and so I want to make sure that we're all starting from that level. So that's where we start. Um, and then I like to sort of break apart assumptions. So I go through a list of ways in which I hope we can work um, together that leaves space for failure. Um, because when we fail, we can go farther than we've ever imagined possible. And when we know that there is space for failure, um, people are willing to try riskier things. And that's what I pay good money to see. People make impossible choices and take creative leaps that they never thought that they could make. So that whole first day and that whole first part of my process is about building a container that can hold that kind of experimentation in the room. And then from that point forward, I have to do what I said I was going to do. I have to make the space when things don't work. I have to be responsive to the change. Um, I come from a, an acting background that I started off as an actor. And so my Meisner teacher, um, who is Audrey Francis, who's now the co-artistic director of Steppenwolf Theater Company, um, she would say that you do all of the preparation before you get into the room. And the second that you get into the room, you are present. So I might have pre-blocked this. I might have thought about how I want this scene to look a million different ways. Um, but the second I get into the room, I'm going to be inspired by what those people say, what they're feeling and what they're giving to me. And that is going to dictate the choices that I make in the room. And then beyond that, I like to tell my cast and I'll tell all of you now that there are about five moments that I will feel really, 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 really passionately about. I'll feel really intensely about wanting to make those happen. And that is, was actually a nugget that I took from a playwright, Isaac Gomez, because he goes through a lot of new play development and people are like, how does it even, does it even stay the same play by the end? I mean, you've been working on it for five years. 
And they were like, I get to pick like five or six moments that are, that shape this piece for me. And so when you look at like um, Sid Field's sc screenwriting books, these sort of five moments that start to emerge are all directly related to the most important moments of storytelling within the piece. And so I pick those five or six moments. I get really nitty gritty about them. And then everything else I play fast and loose. If, some, if my collaborators bring me a really strong opinion, I want to follow it. I want to explore it. And fortunately here at Opera San Jose, there is time afforded for that kind of exploration. Thank you. Shauna? Yeah, that's great. That's a great explanation. I align with Tara very closely in the methods of directing. And I think that does come because we're both come from theater, right? So um, theater has its own practices in the way actors approach creating roles. And I do think that there's a bit of a trend now more in opera, because I think for a number of years, it was really like regie theater, like, you know, you singers would come in the room, they just have to do exactly what the director told them, you know, regardless. And I think there's a new echelon of directors who say, you know, I, you've played Violetta 45 times, T tell me more. Um, I've always thought of my directing style as I, I build a spiritual jungle gym. It's my responsibility. That's what I do before the rehearsal process. And like Tara said, I mean, I do so much work. I pre-block everything. I act out the scenes. I look like a lunatic in my apartment. Um, and I've got it all mapped out, but I never insist on what it is I've drawn in my notebooks or in my score. I want to spiritually invite everybody into the jungle gym so that we can play together and find something even more remarkable. Um, because when, when a singer says like, well, I really can't do that because I'm singing fill in the blank. I, I absolutely believe them because I, they, they, they're the ones singing, they're the ones inhabiting the role. And so they're reporting from the field. You got to listen to them. You got to hear what they have to say, and then you got to respond. And, you know, Sometimes that means a tenor will tell you, no, I just, I, I got to sing at center. So you as a director, you got to think, well, could we compromise? How about downstage right? <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's a, it's a really fun and funny collaboration. And, you know, the, the most fun you can have is when everybody is like coming into the room and they feel their best about what they're put, bringing to the stage. And like Tara said, you know, I, I too have these, like, it's like you have these visions where it's like this moment has to be this. This is the dynamic, the power, this is the story that I need the audience to understand. And then everything else around it can, you know, we can like work through it together and it can be fluey and blah, 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 blah. But there are those like real points that, you know, you, you feel very passionately about. And then sometimes you have to give them up and it's so hard but one of my directing mentors, you know, is the famous quote, kill your darlings, kill your darlings. And it's tough to see them go. But what you say to yourself is, okay, not this time. There will be a production where that happens and it will, it will be the right one. Thank you. So you've both worked as assistant directors. Um, how does that impact, that experience impact you as you become a director? Well, I, I, I'm going to jump in here for a minute okay. because what most people don't know underreported about opera is that a, opera assistant directors is a different ball of wax than just assistant directing. Assistant directing in theater is like, I would say, a kinder, gentler sort of a road. Mm -hmm. An assistant director in opera, you you are kind of a little bit of a captain of the ship. You know, you're like the the whip the you know the minority whip or something <laughs> you, you've got to like come up with creative solutions that serve both the company and the director's vision you've got to work hand in glove with stage management you've got to be a manager of time um you know assistant directors in opera are tasked with creating the schedule each day now that sounds like sure okay creating no 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 
you break it down by 15 minute increments and it really matters because you're balancing a number of union rules. You're figuring out when people come, you're, you're pacing yourself against the director. Is this a director who's fast? Is this a director who's slow? Cause you don't want singers sitting in the room who aren't being used, right? You create a massive amount of paperwork. You're responsible for taking the notes and then often delivering them to sopranos who are not interested in hearing what the director has to say and then tell you. And then you're like, well, I really feel that I hear, I hear what you're saying. Now, I think if we could come to, you're trying, you know, you're like the UN. I mean, it's the role of the assistant director. It's difficult to really articulate in opera, how many skill sets you have to have, because you've got to be, you've got to be able to read music. You got to not be scared to speak a foreign language that is not your tongue, you know, like I may speak Russian fluently, but you have not heard anything until you've heard my French. It's one of the worst things you've ever heard in your whole life. And it makes every rehearsal room laugh. And that is my, that's my gift. We can all have a good laugh at Auntie Sean and not being able to speak French. <laughs> Fine. You've got to be willing to, even when you're not at fault, be like, you know what? That's my, that's my mistake. I, I'll stand up and take that just to keep the production moving forward. And then when the director sits next to you during piano tech and cries and says, the show's horrible, I've messed all up, you get to be the cheerleader to say, keep going, we're doing great. <laughs> so, you know, I say that to laud, um, you know, Tara's work, not just as a director, but as an assistant director, she's someone that singers know they can go to when they're having a really hard time. They can depend on her for practical facts, for spiritual facts, everything in between. Um, and the work of the assistant director of opera, it's something that I really want to pitch to like Bravo TV. You know, if you've ever seen like B Below Deck or Real Housewives, I think the, assist the world of the assistant director in opera is definitely worth a Bravo expose. Great, great. Absolutely. Okay, Tara, let's, let's hear your perspective. Um, uh, the work of the assistant director, Shauna, when she came here, uh, crystallized it for me in a way that I hadn't yet articulated for myself, which is that it's your responsibility to know this production better than anybody else. Um, and you will start by trying to know the score better than anyone else, though so that is that it, for me at least is a is a an always kind of failing battle but i will continue to try to do that um and then by the end you and i am the one calling out where we're going from i am the one anticipating what literally every person around me needs someone breathes and i look at them and i say yes how can i help you <laughs> um it's your spidey senses in overdrive all of the time because i'm not just thinking about the director and i'm not just thinking about the stage manager who are right here i'm also thinking about the conductor and the assistant conductor and the repetitor um i'm thinking about the wardrobe um the head of wardrobe i'm thinking about the two asms and i'm thinking about every single chorister on stage so at some point that's thinking about 150 people at once and being able to navigate the different personality types the power dynamics at play in the space and as shauna said and i will say rather indelicately um it's jumping on the grenade sometimes people are like who is responsible for this problem you're like me can we move on now? <laughs> Here's the solution. I have it for us. So sorry that happened. Um, I have a, uh, as I was learning to direct and coming up and directing, I <laughs> also worked as a customer service representative and then eventually started training people for how to be nice and how to apologize. And I say, I have apologized thousands of times. It has literally been my job to apologize. So if somebody needs me to apologize in order for us to move through, like, great, I, I'm so sorry. Let's do this thing now. Um, so it's that willingness to sort of sacrifice yourself in that moment um, so that we can all move forward together. And I, I, I'll jump in and say there are some other surprising duties just practically for example, one time I was the San Francisco, I was the assistant on a production of Andrea Chenier and the soprano became very ill on the morning of a performance. There was no understudy. At 3 p.m. I received an email and it said, go to the costume shop and have a costume fitting. 
And I, it was unclear if she was going to make it onto the stage or if someone was going to have to sing from a score down right while I went on. So I had a costume fitting. I was in a full face of makeup and a wig cap standing backstage, ready to go on. Now it was Anna Perozzi. She did manage to go on that evening because she's tough and a wonderful soprano, but I was inches across, inches away from making my debut on the great stage there. And so that's something under advertised as assistant directors, you know, having done, having worked at the Met during Omicron, the, one of the ballet masters, she had to go on in the production of Cinderella. And so when you work backstage, sometimes it's just about doing whatever it takes in service of the production to make sure that the audience receives the wonderful show that they're expecting and you're, you're willing to do it. You do what it takes. Yeah. So, so that's an interesting story about that. Andrea Chenier. I, I love that opera. And I went to all the performances at, at, at San Francisco, but I did get a call from development that, that afternoon telling me they might cancel the performance. So just wanted to give me a heads up. They didn't tell me the rest of the story. So I was in, I was, I was in the audience the night that uh, you were standing by. Well, I was standing in the wings. <laughs> I had, yeah, I reviewed my blocking and I was ready to mouth the words. Because that you have to be ready to lip sync too, <laughs> and um, so uh, that that's fantastic. Uh, thank you. So, in a rehearsal, have you ever had uh, uh, while you're working out the staging or the what what you want to have happen on the stage? Have you ever had an artist say, "I won't do that," and if so, then what do you do about it? Um, one thousand percent. Every, I mean, like every process. Oh, um, really? I won't, okay. or I can't, or it's impossible, or anything like that. Um, and I think at that point, I get to decide if, if a of all, if I, if I agree, if it seems impossible to them, then it's probably impossible, right? So, like believing them and taking them at their word because as Shauna said they're the ones on the front line um but then also decide if it's worth navigating differently so is it worth saying tell me more about what is impossible or tell me more about how this can't happen I want to understand from your perspective. And so from that point, it becomes about how do we find the yes? Where is the yes in this storytelling? Um, because there's a million ways to tell every story. Sure. And so if we can't, if the yes isn't immediately what I proposed, and I also don't like their yes, then where is our yes? Thank you. Shauna? Yeah, you know, it's easier when it's, your own show because then you can like you can collaborate there you can do all kinds of things you can do some woo woo magic to try to get kind of what you're aiming for you can come to an agreement you can try again a different day when people sometimes people just need a snack and a nap and then you try again and they're like oh sure that's no problem it's true. Like it just depends on the hour of the day. If it's getting close to lunch or, you know, the end of the day, try not to propose any kind of like large staging ideas on people because it's not going to go well. Um, when it becomes really difficult is if you're ever tasked with reviving some of these like beloved classic productions that audiences have known and loved for years. I've been fortunate enough to work um, twice on Robert Carson's production of Mephistophele, which is, you know, I, Sam Raimi was in it in the 80s. I and mean, it's beautiful, magnificent production. And, you know, you do come to these moments in which new cast members say, but I, you know, I, I can't, I can't do that. Or I, I would never do that. And then you, you know, I'm not Robert Carson. So I've got to figure out a way to honor the original vision and interpretation of the piece while listening to the artist who says like, I can't possibly sing that note stage left. I have to be stage right. And you're like, well, there is no lighting stage, right? So you're going to be in the dark. Um, and so you, you, you've got to find a way to get everybody to yes. And that, 
that takes some negotiating. It, it takes some, some hard and soft skills because it doesn't work just to say like, sorry, that's what it is. I mean, sometimes they're, you know, it's like, this is the moment in which we attach you and you're going to fly through the air. Cause you, there are archival videos and you signed the contract. So you know what the production is. And at some point you're going to fly in the air. I'm sorry. It's like, we all signed the contract to be here. So get on your harness. We're doing a safety talk. Here we go. So, you know, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting and intellectual, but complicated thing that you're negotiating all the time with getting people to yes, all the time. That's, that's fascinating. So how do you collaborate with a conductor? Uh, Tara, you want to start? Oh, come on. <laughs> um, uh, carefully, no, excitedly, all of the above. <laughs> um, so my very first show that I worked on that I will not list in this moment, but if you did enough research, you could probably find um, the conductor and the director had this very strong mutual respect for each other's artistry and clearly disagreed on so many details of everything. And so that was a really a blessing. It was a blessing to be able to see that um, because figuring out how they would collaborate and how I would help this and support the singers in navigating such sometimes intense disagreements about what should be happening in a given moment um, let me know from jump that I was in a much more complicated rehearsal room than I was in a theater that is a play where there is clearly like one director but when there is a conductor they are your they're your team they're your partner and sometimes your partner wants to hang out with you and wants to talk to you about every little detail and sometimes your partner would prefer you to stay on your side of the road and they stay on their side of the road and sometimes we'll interact but for the most part they there is less collaboration so at that point it just depends on what kind of collaboration can i have with that person and what would they like I am a highly collaborative person and I like literally want to sit and talk through every single moment for 15 hours with everybody. Um, but that's just, that's a luxury of time and uh, probably in some ways my own newness um, to the art form that allows me to have that sense of, of, of joy and wonder in all of those moments. Whereas, you know, if it's my first Tosca versus somebody's 70th Tosca, it, it might be different for them. Um, and so having a, a respect for the, my teammate and my collaborator is the most important thing for me. And that's how I lead from it. I'm like, this person is a genius in and of their own right. And that is something in the rehearsal rooms in opera that I experienced from day one as an assistant director that I had never experienced as an assistant director in theater. Everyone believed that I was supposed to be there. And I felt like I didn't know that I was supposed to be there yet. And that mutual respect was a part of that process. So everyone believes that you are supposed to be there and that you are ready. And so you're just like, okay, I'm gonna put on my tennis shoes and I'm gonna get ready and like try to rise to the occasion. And so that has been what my collaboration has also been with the conductor. And so some conductors I can say, hey, what are you thinking of in this moment? And other conductors, I need to wait and see. And so I learn who they are and what kind of person they are and what kind of collaboration they want to have and meet them wherever they're at. Great. Shauna? Yeah, that's, it's a great question because it is, it's, we're very fortunate to have Joseph Marquezo as our music director, I would say. He is one of the most collaborative conductors I've ever worked with in my career. I mean, he and I, you know, we worked as assistants side by side for many years. So we already knew each other's working styles. And he was someone I turned to when I was studying in opera, I would call him and say, what's what recording should I listen to? Cause I, I trust his opinion, but at the same time, he trusts my opinion. And so, you know, I frequently gave him notes throughout the fall staff process because I know that score inside and out and really pushed him. And he was deeply appreciative because I was pointing things out to him that 
helped him with the, with the musical product, with the artistic product. And so that's what I'm always looking for with a, with a, with a conductor. It's about, you know, I'm making something that I want to serve the audience in terms of experiencing the piece, the work, the music, something that serves the artists who are in it. And I always think about the conductors, the maestri as my fellow kind of facilitator who's like helping with, you know, build the recipe. And so if the conductor says you need to add more eye of newt here, then I'm, I've got to like, think about that. You know what, in this moment there, the best conductors say like, look in the score. Did you think about this? Cause they can, they, they often work from the full score and we work from the piano vocal. And so of course I've listened to the opera a million times, but I don't have the full score in front of me. So I might miss like, oh, that that's the moment in which like the bells are coming in or the, the, the composers evoking something else. And those best collaborators just, they, they ping you throughout the process and say, but like, oh, in the full score, this is what's happening. So that then it, it just, it adds to the stage action. It gives you like more ideas serves it better that that's what you're always aiming for thank you so what's your proudest moment as a director or uh, the production you're most proud uh, you're most proud of or a project you're most proud of we'll start with tara oh come on <laughs> <laughs> um i i um I got asked this question the other day and oh, okay. I very diplomatically, but in hindsight also very honestly said that I can usually say that the project that I'm working on right now is my favorite project and my proudest accomplishment. Um, so in this moment and in this time, it is Tosca. That makes sense. <laughs> um, and. I am fortunate that this is a very full circle moment for me in many different ways. Um, the first Tosca that I ever saw live was Shauna's Tosca at SFO. Um, this is the culmination of three years as a resident director here at Opera San Jose. Um, when I randomly was looking up what the top 10 most produced operas were, Tosca was on the list. And I was like, well, somebody's going to make me do a Puccini sometime. She seems like a badass. Let's go that way. And so it's, it's hitting on many different levels. And then when Maria was announced to be the Tosca, she was the first person that I worked with here at Opera San Jose because I assistant directed her role debut in, um, in the title role uh, for but for butterfly so so in all of those reasons um it's very kismet it's very it feels very faded and so there is some sort of like beautiful woo woo happening for me there but also it is the culmination of everything that i've ever done up until this point and everything that i've learned up until this point and i got to spend five weeks falling in love with all of my collaborators and I that love is very large and big right now and yeah thank so you this That's is great. my favorite project <laughs> okay Shauna um well you know I'm gonna say my favorite project because and I've been so fortunate to work on a lot of really great shows with a lot of really great people in different capacities and um, I think the revival, I mean, it's hard, it's hard. I think the revival of my Tosca at San Francisco, which reopened the opera house after COVID is probably my proudest moment as a director, because four weeks to the day that I had my daughter, JJ, I was in the rehearsal room and I knew that going in that I, as soon as she was a week late. And so I was also late for rehearsal. Um, but we got on a plane and we flew to San Francisco from New York and I had her strapped on me and she attended almost all of the rehearsals, including orchestra stagings. Um, she does not like act three of Tosca, but likes act one and two. Um, and that was a really proud moment, not just because we were reopening the opera house, which felt very significant, but that 
that, you know, I had had the chance to do the production in the first place in 2018 that I had my daughter with me, who was just brand new to this life and that we were kind of kicking off a new chapter of life coming out of COVID. And so the opportunity to invite Tara, who's I have long respected as a collaborator, um, to, to have her own relationship with a piece that meant so much to me and still does, um, was a chance I, I was so thrilled about. It was one of the things I knew almost instantly about this season was that yes, Tara would direct Tosca because that was a transformative moment for me in my directing career. And if I could make that possible for another early career woman in the industry at large, that was something I felt really passionately about. And so um, it, it speaks specifically to the beautiful mission of Opera San Jose, that this is a company where up and coming directors, singers, designers, administrators have the opportunity to sink their teeth into these masterpieces and the incredible generosity, warmth, and excitement of our patrons, because you do feel it as an artist here. I know Tara feels that way too. Um, it's, it's not like working other places. It is the best place to work. And that has everything to do with our patrons and the people who attend our shows. So, you know, my Tosca, but then in, in a reverberated way, this Tosca is my favorite um, production as a director and general director in a meta kind of way. Sure. That's uh, fantastic. Listen, I'm going to turn the tables on, on, on everybody. Larry, I'm turning the tables on you. You've now been directed by both me and Tara. Tell us, tell everybody on this call from the inside. How, how, how have our styles been different and how has being on stage affected you as an audience member? Um, actually, you're both pretty similar. Um, it's clear, it's clear you come to the theater having done tons of homework. So, and, and, and I think that you have this vision in your heads of, you know, you, you've already seen the, the movie version of the opera that you're, you're going to create. Um, now, having said that, you're very collaborative and, uh, uh, and, and you do a great job of where there's a problem. And it's almost sort of, you know, these five magic moments where not all of them are going to work. You figure out a way to, you both figure out a way to, uh, get past that problem and actually make what happens on the stage, I think, better than what you, you had originally intended. Um, so I, I and uh, I, I remember, um, and you're, again, I, I emphasize, uh, you're very collaborative. You're trying to make this, you know, group of hundreds of people um, uh, have a good time, feel like they're delivering a great performance, but also, um, you've got to tell the story. So um, I remember, uh, I remember at a Tosca rehearsal, uh, uh, Shauna was, uh, and this was uh, the 2018, the, 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 the new production that you directed, uh, tw toward the end of, uh, it, was, it was toward the end of the last act. Um, and it was toward the end of the, you know, it was, it was a half an hour before the rehearsal was supposed to end. It wasn't working very right. It wasn't working very well. And I always remember it, I, I, that Shauna said, you know, I need to think about this tonight. Um, and you ended the rehearsal a half an hour early and everyone was ecstatic. So I, I, I actually, and I had a great, a lot of respect for you because you were honest about the fact that this wasn't working and, 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 and you need to re rethink it. And then I've had Tara twice do this and I, and I think it's great um, I, I had a little bit part in the uh, uh, in the uh, uh, one of the digital uh, projects we did during covid yeah. and, sing for uh, your supper yeah and uh, uh, sing for your supper yeah and uh, so Tara asked if I, uh, 
if, if I could, you know, she wanted to sort of expand the role and she asked, um, you know, could I do something? And I said, sure. And she immediately says, well, then show me, do it. <laughs> and uh, and the, 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 the same way in, in Tosca, um, uh, you were restaging the Te Deum and you said, okay, I want you, I want you to try this. Uh, and I said, sure. And she, and she said, well, do it right now, do it. <laughs> so I always get a kick out of it. Um, you know, um, being on stage, I mean, for, uh, again, you got to take into account, I'm an opera addict uh, and, a, and a music nut, but um, I think there's, I love being in the audience and I, I, I had the honor of sitting in the orchestra pit probably 10 or 15 times in various operas and I, and I love that. But I think being on the stage is the best. Uh, uh, it, you know, you, you have all that incredible singing around you. Uh, um, you can hear the orchestra and, and I just think it's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's just total magic. And, um, and I always find it amazing that you, you can't see the audience. So, you know, you you might be able to see the, a little bit of the orchestra and you can, you know, the, you can see the conductor, but um, all this magic is happening in front of you. You know, there, you know, people are out there, but you can't, you can't, you can't see them. And uh, uh, at any rate, I, I it, it's been, I, I've, uh, I've actually, I did a cameo role uh, in that Mephistopheles you're talking about. Um, and uh, uh, for one night, so I, I, I got all gussied up and, and, and I was on that one night. I was a, I've been a monk in um, Don Carlo. And then I've been the Cardinal twice in Tosca, actually three times now in Tosca, two San Francisco to Toscas and, and one Opera San Jose. And then uh, um, I was the, the uh, part that uh, Shauna created the naughty Cardinal in the uh, in Flores party in the LA, uh, in, the, in the San Francisco La Traviata. So anyway, it's, it's been a great experience. That's a wonderful response. And Larry, we, I know I speak for Tara and I both that we love directing you. So we'll continue to create roles for you. That's an advertisement. Get involved if you want to be on the stage. Um, yes, please. I, we've got two questions that I think didn't get answered in the chat. And I know we're just a little bit over time. So I'll, I'll go over them quickly. The first question is what is a repetiteur? That's the rehearsal pianist. So playing along for the rehearsal. And then um, how would you handle a brand new opera? No recordings, no Wikipedia articles. That's from Steve Lazarus. Thanks for that question. Cause it is a, it is a complicated one. It's a difficult one um, because you don't necessarily, sometimes there are these kind of electronic recordings. They never give you the right sense of what the music is like. You don't get a feel of the orchestra. It's really hard. It's a little bit like going into a dark hallway and you've got to like trust yourself that you're really getting a sense of the story. Um, and so that's why workshops are so important. Um, workshops really make the difference for being able to prepare um, not just the music, but also staging possibilities. Because when someone is developing a new opera, they might be like, all right, well, this scene takes place in the kitchen and then we need to be in a baseball field and they only write three bars of music. And you, you know, that's where you bring in the stage director who says, now listen, we might need more than three bars of music to transition from a kitchen to a baseball field. Um, so that's a, that's a plug for why workshops are so important. Theater world does that all the time, workshopping new plays to get a sense of what the piece is, because when it's all in your head, it's very different than when you're working with a whole group of people. So um, I'll take this moment just to extend a hearty thank you to Tara for joining me this evening and a hearty thank you to Larry Kern for moderating our discussion. Um, thank you everyone for being here tonight. Of course, this is subscriber appreciation month. So if you have not yet resubscribed quickly, you've got to hop on there, grab your subscription because we're already cooking up more exciting activities for our 40th anniversary season in an ancillary programming for our subscribers only. So thank you for being a part of the OSJ family. Thank you for being here tonight. And thank you, Larry and Tara. We'll see you at the California Theater. Thank you.